Hello, Foil Chat. Good evening. Thank you for joining us, viewers, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube for this Sinn Féin leadership update briefing, chat conversation, and exchange of views. Uh, and I'm joined this evening by my colleagues, uh, Piers Doherty, TD, from the beautiful county of Donegal, and by Louise O'Reilly, TD, from the beautiful, more beautiful, perhaps some may say, county uh, of Dublin this evening. And you've been in touch with us in very large numbers. We've lots of questions. We have a lot of ground to cover this evening. We'll do our best to get through as much of it as we can. But first of all, let's just consider for a moment the last number of weeks. When the doll raised, rose for its uh, summer holidays, for its recess, it was you, Louise, who got to, to your feet on behalf of Sinn Féin to say to everybody, look, we can't take six weeks, was it? We can't, we can't take that length of time off in, in recess. And we argued for a much shorter break to give everybody a chance to have some time with their families and so on. Um, but we knew from the beginning that six weeks was, was just too long in the midst of of this pandemic and with all of the big issues that are facing all of you and your families and communities. But I have to tell you, we could never have guessed that things would go from chaotic governance to absolutely chaotic and shambolic government in the space of a few short weeks. And I was very struck when the, the last straw of, of that meeting, that, that dinner in, in Galway, and it was almost like a snapshot from a bygone time. I was reminded of the Galway tent. I was reminded of that old politics where the old guard, Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael, rub shoulders with the great and the good, with banking lobbyists, for example, where they had, you know, very tight relationships, in, in our view, inappropriately so, with, with senior judges. And I was reminded just how the system on Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael, how they'll go to no ends to kind of keep things their own way. We saw that in the election, do you remember? We knew all along that, you know, the old guard would do everything and anything to keep change out. And that, of course, meant keeping Sinn Féin out. But I don't know um, about you, lads, but I was so struck at just how blatant and how brazen this was. And I, I know people were upset and and really concerned around the, the health regulations and, and all of that. But it, it occurred to me that actually as big an issue is the fact that you were still seeing the political establishment at play. Um, and it's those same people who are so determined to keep Sh Sinn Féin out, to keep change out. I didn't even know there was a golfing society, to tell you the truth. In fact, I thought... Maybe if we look to join the Golfing Society, they might disband it. Just to say. Um, Mary Lou, it's, so it's really? a secret society that it was in, within the doll. Uh, I did know about the Golfing Society because I got them to remove a picture of the Golfing Society with Michael Fingleton in the middle of them uh, 10 years ago from the doll, which they hung proudly in uh, the doll's private members bar, which... Uh, was uh, away from the public, but I think you're absolutely right. That's the. This is one of the events you kind of know about. The public got an insight into, but it did smack of all of that. The Galway tent, the Druids Glen. Remember that golfing out and where you had the Tisha down taking advice from senior bankers, and you know again was exposed uh, under questioning from from Sinn Fein, but. People are just, I think, sick of, of that type of inner circle, that type of uh, politics. And, and that's the change that they voted for. And that's the change that we're, you know, we're going to continue to bring about. It was like an episode of Back to the Future for a lot of people. They, they, they looked at this and they just thought, well, hang on a second now. This is the same old, same old. And the same as that. What, what they're saying to us when we meet them, when we're out and about, is we voted for change. We wanted that change. And this is just a, a really stark reminder that uh, Establishment Ireland, as led by Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael, uh, is back, you know, but wants to get back in business and wants to maintain the status quo. And people don't want the status quo. They want the change that they voted for. But they are very, very annoyed at this trip back to the past. You know, the old boys club, the boys are back in town, all of that. That's just driving people up the wall at the moment. And you can you can hear that. And I think the the uh, the the straw that uh, kind of broke the camel's back for an awful lot of people uh, was just seeing the guest list. I think that just because it's a who's who of the elite, um, you know, senior banking lobbyists, former Fine Gael minister, obviously. 
uh, you know, senior politicians, senior members of the judiciary all coming together uh, in what is effectively a secret society. There's three TDs on this call and, and, and none of us uh, have been invited to join. Um, I, I didn't, I, I vaguely knew that, that uh, there was a kind of a club for playing golf. I didn't know how formal it was. I didn't know it was 50 years old. Uh, and I'm not a bit surprised I wasn't asked to join it, uh, nor would I have if I had been. Um, but, you know, I think it, it was a, a a glimpse for people into uh, the old guard back to their old ways and people don't want that they really don't no, you're absolutely right i mean people the, the whole theme of politics now before the election through the election and since the election has been that huge public appetite for for change so it's been a rough number of, of weeks um but we are asking people not to lose faith um we're also asking that the doll come back now i mean I spoke to the Taoiseach on, um, on Friday morning and I put it to him that the doll had to come back. And at that stage, he was saying no, that he, he did not accept the need for that to happen. They've moved and they are, they say, going to bring the doll back. But uh, for, we cannot understand and we don't accept that there needs to be any delay. I mean, let's face it, what's done is done now. And in a, in a, in a really, really important way, what matters is, is what happens next. And what we believe is that what needs to happen next is that politics needs to get ahead of the big issues and, and start to give leadership um, to the people that we represent because there's big issues facing us. And I, I know we're certainly not prepared to tolerate more and more chaos, more and more confusion, mixed messages, because I know that that has really not alone angered, it's really unnerved people because this is the time for leadership and nowhere perhaps more so uh, than currently in the in the area of education. And we have had uh, a huge number of questions on this. Uh, we've heard from dozens and dozens of people from Anna, Lorraine, Tommy, Eileen, Kathleen, I could I could make name more. And what everyone seems to have in common, and I have to say as a parent, I'm there too with you, is just a, a real concern that despite the efforts of, of, of teachers and, and people in our school system and parents, that the whole thing is very, very confused. So one of the issues that's been coming in is the whole issue of school transport, the issue of capacity moving from 100% to 50%, and, and a real concern for parents, particularly peers in rural areas, as to how we're going to get our children safely, safely to and from schools. Yeah, and like this is just building into the anxiety of of where parents are at, um, and a lot of this was predictable. Now we're not suggesting that there wasn't a big lift here to be done by the department, the minister, but most importantly, the people who really did the big lift in here were the teachers and the board of management. Uh, those volunteers right over the uh, the summer period when when. The, the were on their break who have prepared schools and all the rest. But there was a number of things that Donna Lira for us were outlining straight away that needed to be done. We knew we needed additional teachers. We needed additional financial supports for the schools, for cleaning equipment, sanitizers, and so on. We needed um, additional space for some of the schools. And the other thing was we needed to deal with school transport. Now, the fact that the government and the minister, who hasn't been seen for a number of weeks, had left it to the last minute. It was just in the last number of you know days that that this decision was made to say now school transport must operate at fifty percent capacity. So that's the direction as of I think Wednesday of last week. At uh, bus Aaron are saying okay that's fine, but that means we need to nearly double all our buses. The private bus operators are saying. But sure, we've contracts with the board of management for a set price, and now you're telling us we can only take half the number of pay, pay, uh, students, and we now need to acquire a different uh, bus, but also we need to renegotiate the contracts and all that. And this is just absolutely terrible. So people, parents who were anxious about the, the fact of children going into school in cramped buses got some relief when Neffet came out and says, no, that can't happen, it has to be 50% capacity. But then letters came out from Bus Air and telling them, well, that's where we're going to be, but for the start, all your children have to go into a, a cramped bus because they left it far too late. And that's what is really causing uh, concern, confusion. Uh, you know, when you talk about getting children back to school and it can be done and should be done, it's happening right across Europe, but it has to be done safely. And, and taking things down to the wire, whether it is about uh, announcing the guidelines in terms of how to, uh, to prepare your classroom safely or how to transport your children to school safely. And still there's other things that we simply don't know 
you know, as a, as a parent of both primary and secondary school teachers or students, like what happens if there's an outbreak? What 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 happens? We're getting mixed messages from schools, and I'm talking to parents. They're they're saying, well, you know, the child can go back. Uh, we'll have to isolate, but can only come back if they have a negative test. If they're displaying symptoms, now they're told. We've heard some schools actually send an out letter saying, no, that's not the case. They can go back to school. That's causing anxiety for other parents. We need clear guidance. We need leadership, and we have a minister that has simply gone missing over the last period of time at a crucial period of time for parents and teachers and board management's alike. I think Pierce said it, said it well there. I mean, the people who've been doing it and doing the heavy lifting are the teachers, um, you know, and the principals. My sister is a school principal and she has been working night and day in the absence of, of clear direction uh, a lot of the time. But she's actually she wants to get the kids back to school for the sake of the kids. They need to go back to school. Everybody wants to see it happen and see it happen safely. But let's not forget, I mean, we, you know, the country was put into a serious lockdown and that was really important that that was done and at the time that it was done. But we were told that this was, you know, to ensure that we could have enough time to take the pressure off the health system and also to prepare for reopening the economy. And looking at it now, you'd have to ask, you know, what was the level of preparation? And I mean, I'm not the only one. We're not the only party uh, that, that, that are saying this. Um, we're not the only group saying it. Everybody is asking, where is the leadership from the Department of Education? And what work were they doing over the last couple of months? Where was the minister? Why is the minister not out in front? Because teachers, pupils, parents, everybody uh, in the school community preparing to go back wants that leadership. They have questions. They want those answers. They absolutely do. And I, I can see it in my, as I said, my own sister. She is working night, noon and morning to get this done. She really wants it. To, she really wants the school to be able to open. We all want schools to open safely. But. The minister is absent once again, and we've been putting forward those solutions. Donica O'Leary has been putting them onto the record, as has Rose Conway Walsh in relation to all of the the, uh, the kids getting back and university students starting. And there's just been an absence of any plan from uh, the Department of Education or any but clear guidance. You can see it, Mary Lou, in, in, in one, of the th one of the first things Donna Howe said when the Leave Insert uh, decision was that they were going to go for the type of grading system as well. What happens with homeschooling? And they didn't have an answer and they still didn't come up with an answer and they left it for a, a student to actually take the state to court and win a victory in the court last week, which would now have possibly have an impact on 3000 other students who are home. Students. But th this is leaving it far, far too late. And it's just a, a lack of preparation, a lack of planning. And yes, there's big decisions to be made, but the schools have been closed since March. You know, there are a lot of time has passed. We should have got this right. We shouldn't have left it to the last minute. Uh, and now they're putting a lot of parents, teachers uh, and children in, 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 in very difficult positions. I mean, one of the things that also struck me and that, that, that will lead to, because all of these issues, folks, that we're addressing here with you, uh, we're signaling and signposting for you. These are the questions and the issues that need to be raised in the doll. This is why we need the doll back, because we need clarity and we need to see the shape of the plan around all of these uh, issues. I mean, that issue of the what if there is a breakout or a cluster in a school is hugely concerning for parents. And we need straight answers from, from the department uh, on that. I was struck at the, not alone the, the, the resistance to actually publishing this algorithm in terms of leaving cert grading, but, but listening to members of government, I got the clear impression that none of them actually understood what was going on. In fact, I saw the Minister for Health, now he's the Minister for Health, not Education, but he's a member of Cabinet, when asked about this matter, saying, like, as, as openly, I don't know, uh, was the answer. I don't know, I don't know anything about this. And he said it, it was a matter that was not discussed at Cabinet. I find that absolutely astonishing. I think we need to press very quickly and the government needs to move quickly to publish this algorithm and to give some explanation and some reassurance to students who, let's face it, have been through the mill and their families and all of the stress that has been involved. Because I'm very, very fearful that we're heading into a, a real mess come September uh, the 7th for a huge, huge cohort of, of students. We've, we've seen what's happened elsewhere so the government needs to get ahead of these issues and not be constantly in a crisis management kind of mode. One other uh, group of, of students, Louise, that people are very concerned for are uh, kids or indeed teachers with underlying and serious health conditions. 
um, students with additional needs or special needs um, who, who really feel that they they got forgotten um, in the course of like the, 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 the management or mismanagement of, of the public health emergency, but who now are very, very fearful and asking lots of questions, you know, for for a child, for example, on the on on the spectrum, H how will that work for them and the very particular needs that they have in in the context of a safe return to school? And you know, I heard uh, last week from people in my own area, bus escorts, um, and they will go to to go along with the kids on the school, um, when the the children are travelling to, to 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 schools, for kids to assist kids who have additional needs. And th those parents, uh, I mean, they already feel like they're forgotten about for a very, very, uh, for, for an awful lot of the time and left behind by the government. But they have really clear and serious questions to ask about how they are to manage their kids going back to school because their kids have a right to go back to school and go back to school safely. And yet they're not, they don't seem to be getting any answers at all. And Darren O'Rourke has raised the issue of the bus escorts, I know, uh, with the minister, and I know that he's going to continue to do it. But again, that's, this is a group that nobody had spoken to. They, nobody had asked them, you know, what are the plans in place for bus escorts? What are the plans in place for kids who, uh, you know, who need assistance getting to and uh, coming home from school? And yet again, you know their carers at home what they're saying to us is they feel like they have been sidelined they feel like they have been ignored and left till the end and you know as Pierce said they had, they've had months to get this right these parents have been screaming out from the rooftops for months about the need to put a plan in place and I think you know we keep coming back to this time and time again is that there's no plan they bought themselves time the government were supposed to get themselves some time to plan they did not use that time wisely and now we have uh, a minister who was absent from her role who isn't doing interviews to any great extent isn't answering any questions but we have parents with kids who have additional needs, who are going to need to go back to school and go back to school safely. And all they have are lists of questions and a lengthening list of questions and nobody to, from government to give them the answers. But I mean, again, and you've said it, Mary Lou Pierce, you've said it, I've said it. This is why we need the doll to be reconvened, because we need to be able to stand in front of the minister and ask those questions and try to get answers for those parents. It is the absolute least that these parents and carers deserve is to have some answers. I mean, at this stage, given all of the time that they have had to, to prepare for this. And I think, Mary Lou, it's worth, and I know you you, you were mentioning this in the doll yourself, uh, you had visited a number of, uh, of the areas, but, you know, even outside of COVID, there are parents with children with uh, additional needs, those ch children that are on the spectrum, that won't have a class this, 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 this September because the spaces aren't there, the ASD classrooms aren't there. We are completely and utterly failing a large section of children in our society and it's not today's story or yesterday's story this has been going on for years and years and years uh, like i have my own personal story in in, in relation to this my, my one of my children has uh, additional needs we were very lucky that we got the last class uh, space in the area but i would you know i'd be conscious of the next person uh, who had a children with a child with diagnosis they wouldn't have a a, a classroom or a space in 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 the school and uh, so there is and there's hundreds of children out there and parents who who want to have their children going to school but they, they simply the supports aren't there and the difference when you have that type of support compared to a mainstream classroom a support that suits the child and the needs of the child that can get the best out of the child it is night and day but we are failing them over and over again and this is nothing to do with COVID what COVID has done uh, with children with additional needs and and, and particularly those with a, a, a increased needs is it, it's caused a huge anxiety a lot of children don't understand why people are you know going around with masks in shops and pubs and places like that there school going to school in itself can be an, an anxious time uh, with now you know uh, children on over the age of 13 having to wear masks and stuff like that there has been a lack of preparation there's been a lack of engagement it's really really sinful that this has happened given the length of time that we knew that once the schools were closed that we'd have to reopen them at least by September uh, and and work could have been and should have been done uh, but hasn't been done and and look it's it's it the truth is that uh all of the big, big um, deficits, the big problems in our system, in, in education, for example, the fact that we have some of the most overcrowded classrooms, you know, in, in, in Europe and, and beyond, um, all of that came home to roost. And it's left us, you know, with really, really serious problems. So 
what we would what we are looking for now and what we will make suggestions for and and help to to, to build um is a plan and also then the resources to match the plan because the truth is if they say that every cloud has a, a silver lining well then surely the silver lining of this emergency has to be that finally the system wakes up cops on and says look we, you can't leave an education system to just keep staggering up and leaving so many children behind and, and, and families in such stress. In the area of health, Louise, and you are our former health spokesperson, um, you've moved on to, to a new job for us. But uh, again, uh, I think the same thing applies, doesn't it, in health, that all of the things that we had talked to, and I remember in the last all, famously, Leo Varadkar, when he was Taoiseach, telling me, no, there's no shortages of beds in the system. Do you remember that, Louise? We had that out with them day in and day out, week in and week out. David Cullinan is now uh, our, our, our new uh, health spokesperson. And we, we put forward a very ambitious plan, but we think the right plan for resourcing the health system for what are going to be incredibly difficult times. And I'm struck, Louise, that even in, in terms of that, that strategy of testing and tracing and isolating, that's still not right yet. Sure, sure it isn't. Oh, no, it's not. And uh, and it, again, that's this is the very worrying thing. It, it takes a crisis. It takes a scandal, um, such as we saw in the, the, the meat factories. It takes that to shine a light on the, the test place and isolate. But actually, at the very start of the pandemic, um, we had uh, successive ministers who at that stage, funnily enough, couldn't pass a microphone without talking. And, and now they, they see a microphone, they run in the opposite direction, but uh, they couldn't pass a microphone without telling us it's all about test, trace and isolate and they're going to ramp up the capacity. They're still ramping up the capacity. They still haven't tested 15,000 in one day, although they say that the capacity is there. And we know that contact tracing is not happening. And we know that, uh, that the follow ups are not being done quick enough the key to contact tracing is that you do it quickly that you get your test result back and that you contact all of the people who are close contacts of the person when they have if they have tested positive that's the key so that that's been known uh, since the start of this but i mean we can't talk about health without talking about our, our frontline heroes and i'm not talking about standing up in the doll and giving them a round of applause because the you know the, the time is gone when i think uh, that's going to be good enough and as one of them has said to me when they start taking rounds of applause uh, at the checkout um, in my local supermarket well then i might thank you uh, but that's you know simply that's not good enough you know we need a plan we have published a plan and that plan outlines in minute detail exactly what we need to do in terms of increasing capacity, in terms of managing to live with this virus, while at the same time restarting non-COVID related care. So let's not forget, 819,000 people are on a waiting list at the moment. That's nearly a million people who are waiting for procedures. We all understand why we had to clear the hospitals. We know that the pressure had to be taken off. We absolutely get the need for that at the time, but we all know also that uh, COVID hasn't made sick people waiting on uh, on uh, procedures. It hasn't made them well. Those people are still there. They need to have their care. Uh, they need to have their care needs attended to. So what we've done is we have published, and David Cullinan is, has, has published and written this document, which is comprehensive and it outlines a plan. Stephen Donnelly, if he has a plan, he has not shared it with anyone. Uh, and he certainly hasn't shared it with the frontline healthcare workers who, let's be honest, are terrified of what is coming down the line uh, for them this winter. We are looking at a perfect storm here. We are looking at restricted access. We're looking at reduced capacity. We're looking at potentially an increase in attendees to hospital. And uh, we're looking at the, uh, the fact that we are understaffed. We remain understaffed. There's still a two tier system for consultants and consultants pay. We have the lowest consultant numbers, um, you know, in direct contrast to our uh, classroom numbers we've the lowest consultant numbers in uh, in Europe and you know healthcare professionals they're not just exhausted they're exhausted and they're worried and it isn't good enough uh, for Stephen Donnelly or anybody else to simply offer them a round of applause they need a plan they need to know that somebody has their back and you know I mean we can see by simply looking at the documents that Sinn Féin has produced and looking at the uh, the manner in which David is articulating it we have a plan 
We have a plan. We know what needs to be done. We have identified where the capacity needs to go. And yes, it is ambitious. And yes, uh, we'll have to spend money on it. Absolutely. But we're going to have to spend money on healthcare uh, in the coming months in any event. What we want to see is that opportunity that has been created by COVID to actually expand out our health service, to increase the capacity so that we don't keep coming back to the high trolley numbers and, uh, and all of the misery that goes along with that. We don't want to see our nurses uh, emigrating. That's why in our plan, we're going to offer nurses a contract of employment, a meaningful contract of employment that says to them very clearly, we want you, we want you to stay here, we want you to work here, we want you to work with us to make the health service as good as it can be. And right across the spectrum, healthcare workers are telling us that they are very, very fearful for what's coming next winter. Very fearful. And of course, you have also then the full spectrum in mean, our nurses and doctors for sure, but also the you know, the, the, the health care assistants, the home care workers. I mean, everybody who works within the system um, and uh, the, the, it is uh, truly would be, um, you know, uh, disastrous if we were to have, if we were to see the kind of, of chaotic mismanagement that we've, we've witnessed over the last number of weeks and months, if that were to continue into the autumn and into the winter, I know that people would be fearful to to, to even go to their local uh, hospital, much less to, to seek out uh, care. And the virus hasn't gone away, and and we we need to be really mindful of that, not to cause fear or distress, but just for us to be still washing our hands, having the kind of the you know the aspect of sneezing and your elbow, wearing the mask, wear your mask when you're in the the shop or on on your on transport and to follow all of all of this uh guidance but you know if if the citizens are going to do that if we're asking people to do that well then the government and and the state then needs to match that commitment and uh, not not leave our health system in 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 a state of of crisis almost permanent crisis pierce there's there's a question in here from andrew uh, we got a lot of other questions, but, but here's how Andrew says to us, the housing crisis hasn't gone away. And this government has not only failed to act decisively, um, but they've actually made things work. I think that's a, a very good assessment of what's happened. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And you can even just see it in terms of one of the first pieces of legislation that the government introduced actually took away the protection that renters had in terms of increases in their rent, uh, but also in terms of uh, evictions. Uh, and unfortunately, we've seen a number of evictions and um, some highly questionable uh, activity going on in, in the last number of, of days that were was absolutely scandalous that those that would have viewed it on, on, on social media. Um, and and we pointed this out. We we made this clear that this is what that this is what would happen, that landlords would act unscrupulously, they would wouldn't care whether they were being evicted onto into homelessness or onto the streets. Uh, they, you know, that's the, the reality of it. And when you have a housing emergency, forget about the fact that we're in the middle of a pandemic, but when you have a housing emergency, we should be making sure that renters are protected. That is why uh, Ona Bryn has shown um, huge leadership on this he, on this issue. Uh, one of the first pieces of legislation in comparison to what the government did, where they stripped away the protections from renters, was uh, Owen's bill on behalf of Sinn Féin was to, about protecting renters, to make sure that rents couldn't go up uh, during this period, to make sure that you couldn't be uh, evicted because a, a house was being sold. Um, but we see that that wasn't just the only piece of legislation that then the government introduced when they introduced a thing, a uh, piece of legislation on the justice system. Unbelievably. And I say that unbelievably, they absolutely abused the support that the opposition gives the government in terms of facilitating legislation uh, during this pandemic in a way that goes through the doll speedier, even though in some cases we will vote against it, but we allow it to be truncated because of the, 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 the pandemic. Uh, but they use that to actually insert a clause which only did one thing, which was to overturn uh, a court of appeal decision, which will, which will now allow for vultures to evict uh, people from their family homes easier. Uh, that is absolutely appalling. And the fact that we have Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil TDs actually defending that, it uh, just speaks to the fact that so many people are, are, are out of touch. Look, see, the housing crisis can be solved. 
That's that's what we've showed. And I think people have confidence in Sinn Féin. They have confidence in Owen as our spokesperson that not only do we have the solutions, that we know where we can resource the solutions, but also we have the political will to do this. It can't be done overnight. We know that you can't solve the housing crisis overnight. But by God, the first thing you do is you don't start taking away the supports, the safety nets from people. You actually create more safety nets while at the same time you ramp up the type of legislate uh, the type of supply that we need. I think it was summed up to me, Mary Lou, when you had Dara O'Brien uh, as the Minister for Housing criticising Ona Bryn for bringing forward a piece of legislation, publishing a piece of legislation that would ban this co-living arrangement. Basically, uh, yeah. you know, apartments the size of car parks which are being charged 12 and 1300 euro when you have a housing minister criticizing uh, another td who, who's doing what the housing minister and the department should be doing then you know and unfortunately i think well that we're in for a rough ride uh, and uh, there's not much difference from what owen murphy was doing uh, just a couple of months before i agree and i, I think anyone uh, certainly anyone that, that, that I'm listening to uh, believes that we, we absolutely, we've the wrong people in government, but we absolutely have the wrong person in as housing minister um, because Owen O'Brien has led on this and will continue to do so. And Sinn Féin's the only party that has actually provided a credible plan to actually deliver affordable housing, housing that real people, ordinary people, you know, people who all those people who are up early and out at work, um, but who aren't huge earners uh, or who can't go to kind of get money from relatives or family uh, that, that, that they can actually afford. So that remains front and centre for us. That's a big battle with this government, but it's one that we're going we're gonna to continue fighting. Louise, I have another question in here from Evelyn. And just again, she's just reiterating that sense that... Um, carers are, are a group that's continually um, ignored and taken for granted. Um, and this, I think, is an appeal from Evelyn. I, I know she speaks for thousands of families right across the right across the land for us to prioritise carers. And I want to reassure Evelyn that, that we absolutely will. And in fact, we've talked about this before. We've had long you know, we've had conversations about this before, about the fact that first, actually um, they saved the money, the, the state, a huge amount of money. I mean, my God. Millions, hundreds of millions. And uh, I have always, I've often said this, if uh, the carers in, in this, on this island were to take an ocean and decide to go on strike because they work, they work at the, they are carers and they work as well. You know, we know that if they were decide to, to decide to, to go on strike, to take a day off, um, the state would come, you know, to a shuddering halt because these people are literally, literally keeping their, their loved ones going and very often they get no supports. What we, what I say to carers, and I say it all the time, you know, we stand with you. We know what you're going through. We, you know, we talk uh, a lot about, uh, a lot about carers, but we need to have, again, a plan and we need to have supports and carers themselves have to be central to uh, generating that plan we can't you know we can't put a plan in place for them without them but uh, they very often are forgotten because you know they're at home they are about the business of caring for their loved one they are as it goes saving the state an absolute fortune while they're doing it um you know and i think the the days of taking advantage of carers that, that they have to be out they have to be over they need support but you're looking at really basic things you know like access to respite here in, in, in North County, Dublin, uh, you wait, I think it's 26 months uh, to, to get any kind of respite at all. You know, carers need a break. Uh, they also need politicians who understand what they're going through and who will actually stand up for them. So, I mean, it's not an easy fix. It's uh, We don't have a bag of solutions, but we won't get them unless we actually sit down and the government starts listening to carers because they have been, uh, they've been outlining their difficulties. If you're on social media, you can see it a lot of the time. But as a, a friend of mine who is a carer said to me, she said, sometimes when you're caring for uh, for a loved one at home, it feels a little bit like you're you're on the outside and you're constantly looking in. And social media gives you a bit of a window into the rest of the world, you know, the, and, and the, how people are living. But you very often feel like you're locked out. And that's because there's no support in place to allow carers to do the work of caring, you know, and, and that's extremely valuable work, but also to have a break. And I, I don't think you can overestimate the impact of simply just having a break uh, for carers. They need a break. For sure. And 
just to say this is we've a lot of work to do on this area and I mean through the return of the doll and we want the doll back as soon as possible we want it back this week but also um, in the run into and through the budgetary cycle the budget will be coming up in in uh, October um, and Pierce there are so many people I mean countless people who are still scratching their head and wondering are they ever getting back to work like is this going to happen business owners who are uh, as you know we've all spoken to them um really beside themselves you know people who've worked hard in in some cases for generations building up businesses small and medium-sized businesses and they are i think it would be fair to say at the end of their tether at this stage very very many of them yeah, uh, and unfortunately, we've spoken to quite a number of them who who have who are, who have given up, um, who don't see the the light at the end of the tunnel, um, who 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 don't see a future as a result of the the lack of supports that are there, um, and you know there there's a there's a serious uh, point now where we're about to reach next week. Uh, when the temporary wage subsidy scheme will come to an end, a, a new support scheme will be there, but it is in no way as supportive as uh, what was there. Uh, we're hearing from people in the in the pub trade and in, in hospitality and others. They're saying, look, and uh, from the first of September, we're going to have to let go uh, a lot of a lot of our part time staff because uh, the position that the government have left them in is is if you earn 150 euro or less. You don't get any support from the government whatsoever for employing that person, and uh, so therefore, a lot of these people are cleaners. Uh, they're part-time workers. They're going into in places in rural Ireland where maybe the business isn't open all the time, particularly now as we go into September, October, November. And uh, you know, this is just not good. And there's like uh, uh, we were talking to one business owner who owns a number of pubs, uh, and and uh, uh, around the country, and they were saying, look, you know that. It's either close the business completely, or you know that they're not open, so they have to that they're having to take a, a, these type of decisions. And we've we've challenged the government on that. So what again? What needs to what we need to do is we need to get more in line with what's happened in other European jurisdictions. We have forced the government into uh, giving more in terms of the support grants. We were first out of the trap saying it needed to be ten thousand and twenty five thousand. Uh, now the government have come up with a more convoluted system, but it's still not good enough. They're still trying. They're still making a dog's dinner of it, even though we force them into actually providing more supports but that's the type of thing we need we need more granted but it needs to be not just a one size fits all what we're arguing is you need to look at the specific sectors and that's what's allowed we actually had an amendment and for a piece of legislation that would allow for that type of approach where you could actually support certain sectors over another because not every sector is affected the same way but our ambition here our job our motivation here has to be to make sure that as many businesses who are viable can come through this so that they can continue to employ uh, as many staff hopefully all of the staff that they had uh, before this pandemic and uh, i think and unfortunately that this is the situation but i think that as a result of some of the decisions particularly the te uh, the temporary wage subsidy scheme not being extended and uh, the some other decisions in terms of the lack of grant aid support and uh, I, I i believe that we're going to see a lot of what was temporary unemployment become permanent unemployment and that's going to be a big big challenge for people uh, and that's happening at a time when as we know and uh, the, the 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 pandemic unemployment payment that is being cut and being being cut right down uh, over the next number of months to 203 euro uh, you know and we heard all the commitments we heard all the guarantees from leo brackers and others saying we won't take away your supports while the sector is closed down we'll tell that to the people who worked in the pubs because he did not keep his word, word for them who see their payments going down and many other people in sectors who are not allowed to reopen because of the decision of government to and we're not criticizing some of those decisions it's about public health but when you do that when you force a business to close you have a moral and a financial obligation to the people who have you have made unemployed because they aren't just statistics they're the people who are possibly sitting down uh, at the dinner table today, looking at the bills, looking at the mortgage payments, wondering how they're going to keep their head over, uh, you know, head above water. Uh, and, and, and they're the challenges. They're the, they're the parents that are saying, you know, the kids are going back to school. We know the cost of that. But how are we going to make ends meet? Because that's, that's, the, that's the issues here. The government has a responsibility to continue to support those sectors for as long as is required to, during this pandemic. Yes, like that for One small medium enterprises as well. They they are trying to. Uh, they were 
closed for public health reasons. They're viable businesses. They want to get back. But one of the things that, and certainly business owners are, are, are saying to me, is they, they can't take on debt. They were already, you know, they're only just emerging from the the, the debt that they uh, that they had to incur uh, during the recession. They cannot take any more debt on. So, I mean, what the government offered was a package that was four to one uh, debt in favour of supports. What they should have done was put real supports in place. I mean, the irony of it all when uh, the Taoiseach went to, to Brussels to preach the need for supports instead of debt and then came home and said to, to business owners, small and medium enterprises, small family businesses, one and two parents and businesses yeah but here's a package but we're going to put the heavy emphasis on debt you know what we want to see are people who have been in work getting back to work but also those businesses if they're not supported they won't be able to continue and as Pierce has said you know the the implications of that are going to be very very far reaching we cannot afford not to support these businesses and to support the jobs uh, you know and the people that work in them that's just a simple fact uh, but the government are ignoring them the other thing, Louise, that, that I want to say to you is, um, and we're running tight on time, so I think this might be our last, just our last round. The whole area of protecting workers' rights, I mean, we have always, always stood on the principle that you do not build a healthy, productive, you know, wealth-generating, prosperity-generating economy on the back of low pay, um, insecure work uh, and so on and it's really really important and we refer sure to, to the forefront you're our champion now on, on, on this issue it's really really important that that whole area of protecting workers I mean health and safety obviously but also terms and conditions and in circumstances where business is closed I'm thinking of the Debenhams workers and let's give them a shout out this evening who have just have been magnificent now over the last number of months. And I know you've been out with them. I've been out. Lots of us have been outstanding with them. But I mean, my God, that is, if there was a disgrace and an alarm bell to be sounded, Debenhams is a big, big alarm bell for all of us, isn't it, in terms of this government? Yeah, but it's not the first time that we've seen it. We've had Clearies, we've had Talk Talk, and every single time, if it's Fine Gael, uh in, in charge or Fianna Fáil in charge, they shrug uh, and they say, well, we really, we really make, just need to make sure that that doesn't happen again. And so this has happened and happened and happened, and it will continue to happen until the law changes. So I've published a piece of legislation that would ban tactical insolvencies. I won't go into the technicalities of it, but it would make sure that we won't have another Debenhams. But equally, those workers in Debenhams have a collective agreement. I said this to uh, to the Tanish de Varadkar um, on the floor of the doll there a couple of weeks ago. Like we are working as as politicians, uh, we are working under a collective agreement. You know, he was a doctor in a former life. They had a collective agreement. That agreement was honoured. The Debenhams workers had a collective agreement that covered their redundancy. And, you know, we really need the state to step in and take some action for those workers, but also to make sure that that do, that this does not happen again. Not good enough to just shrug our shoulders and say that was desperate. Now we need to do everything we can to make sure that doesn't happen again and then do nothing. I have the legislation. I've published it. Um, it, it got cross party support previously. We just want to see that legislation go through to implement uh, the, the Duffy Cahill report findings and to protect workers because, you know, workers need to be protected in an insolvency situation because they're, you know, they're losing their livelihoods. They need not to lose uh, the, the benefit of their collective agreement as well. And when it comes to, uh, unfortunately, when it comes to issues of workers' rights, uh, we have a government in Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael that are very often, and the Green Party, let's not forget, very often on the side of the bosses, very rarely on the side of the workers, and workers need people who will stand up for them. They are not represented at the Cabinet table at the moment, and that is very, very, very obvious. It's very, very absent, and I think people are... are very acutely aware of that now. They need a strong voice at the cabinet table for workers. They don't have one at the moment. I think the uh, Mary Lou, I think the shindig in, in, in Clifton there gives a kind of clear window into the priorities of this government when you have, you know, bankers and lobbyists and judiciary and 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 the media indeed and some elements in the media uh, all rubbing shoulders with uh, past and, 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 and current politicians and senior politicians at that. Uh, you know, and it talks about the priority and I think, you know, uh, Louise is 100% right. The voices of workers aren't being heard in the cabinet table and they won't be ever heard at the cabinet table if you're in the following the gale. Those parties are not the parties that prioritise those people. You know, we're, we're, we're talking about recalling the doll because of all of the issues that we've we've discussed and many more that we don't have time to discuss. But remember 30 years ago this time, the doll was recalled 
It was recalled because Larry Goodman was losing hundreds of millions of euro uh, pounds at the time. The beef barn was in trouble. The doll was recalled. There was no, uh, you know, opposition from anybody, you know, at the time in Fianna Fáil or Fine Gael. They came together. They passed emergency legislation. Well, I'll tell you something. We'll be a long, long time waiting for Leo Varadkar, for Michal Martin, uh, indeed for Eamon Ryan to actually lift the phone and say, maybe we should recall the doll to sort out the Debenhams workers or look after uh, the workers in, in the meat plants or deal with the fact that there's outbreaks in direct provision because they're not part of the golden circle. They're not part of the elite. They're not part of the status quo that these two parties want to preserve. And that's why, and we've said it before, that's why they fear Sinn Féin. That's why they fear the outcome of the, the election, because the, the winds of change are blowing. In my view, they're unstoppable. And, and, they, and they know that the good old days, those, those boy clubs are over. So listen, thanks for that, Piers uh, and Louise. And in particular, can I thank each and every one of you for sending in your comments and your questions. We just couldn't get to all of them. Thank you all for being with us and, and for participating in this, uh, in this conversation. This will continue. Um, we, we said to you um, since the election that we are very, very anxious to keep in touch with people, to keep the conversation going and to keep the political momentum going uh, for change. I, I agree with you, Pierce. I think there is something unstoppable now about the new politics and the new Ireland and the appetite for change that's out there. So if you are a person um, who has been enraged or frustrated uh, over the last number of weeks uh, and months, that's OK. Um, but it's not OK for you to lose hope. That's not OK, because together we can actually change all of this. This isn't pie in the sky. New politics, a new government change is absolutely possible. Uh, and we want to work with you to make that happen. We're in the doll to work hard for you, to stand up for you, to challenge government, to challenge the chaos that we've seen, but to also ensure that there is from here on in a plan and the resources necessary to make sure that your children can go back to school safely, that your young adults or you as students can get back into college or university or training or your apprenticeship safely, to ensure that people will have a decent opportunity for good work and for secure work, to make sure that our health services aren't overwhelmed in the autumn and winter, to make sure that we finally get the proper testing, tracing, and isolating system that we so desperately need. And, you know, all of those things are absolutely possible, but they can only happen if we all stick with it. I believe that we're in a, a period of huge and profound change. I believe that when the history books are written, we look back at these times uh, and we'll wonder at the extent to which change happened. And we'll say to ourselves, well, Fair play to the Irish people, because at that moment in time, all of us collectively made a decision that we can do better, made a decision that we can live in a better Ireland, a united Ireland, a fair and an equal Ireland, an Ireland in which nobody with a disability or an additional need needs to beg for the resources that we need, that nobody is humiliated um, in, in looking for decent work, that every business owner, every small and medium-sized enterprise is properly supported. And then we have decent and good work uh, for one and all. All of these things are possible. The people's, people who oppose change will tell you that this is pie in the sky, but friends, it's not. It's all possible. It's all there for us. And we will not stop until we get to that place with you. So thanks for tuning in this evening. We will be in touch. Um, we continue day in and day out working on your behalf. And uh, we look forward to returning to the doll very, very soon. So, Slan Anish, Agus Guramila Mahagwith, Galer.